this is Dana Rangione here. Uh, today I want to talk to you about one of the stories in the Bible. I actually call it a tale of two miracles because it's really two stories or two miracles kind of intertwined with one another. And it's a very exciting account and a lot of interesting things happen. But before we get into it and read the scripture, I want to ask you a question. And I want you to think about this question for a minute. Is 12 years a long amount of time or a short amount of time? That's the question I want you to think about. Because it has a lot to do with our stories today. Our two miracles that are intertwined. For one character in this story, 12 years is a very, very long time. For another character, 12 years is incredibly short. So, is 12 years long or short? It all depends on your situation. Let's dive into the scripture now, and we'll read through the whole story because you need to get all of the verses because, like I said, this is not one miracle and then another. They are literally intertwined. So let's read through the scripture. We'll cover all of that, and then we'll go through and, and just make some notes and some, some things that I want to kind of point out that the Lord has brought to my attention that has been really a blessing to me. So let's look at Mark chapter 5, and we're going to start with verse 21. Mark 5, verse 21. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging me, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado, and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, and entereth then in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand, and said unto her, Talitha kumai, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, Arise. And straightway the damsel arose, and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years. And they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it. 
and commanded that something should be given her to eat. Like I said, an amazing account of two miracles, one right on top of another, and so much that's similar in the stories, but also so much that's different. We have two characters. One, we have his name. His name is Jairus. And the Bible basically tells us he's in poor because he's a ruler of the synagogue. He has servants. He has a family. He is somebody special, or at least would be considered so in the day and age in which he lived. He came to Jesus seeking healing for his daughter who was deathly, deathly ill. But before Jesus could get to him and his daughter, another character enters. And this woman has no name, or at least we're not given a name. I'm sure she had one, but the Bible doesn't mention her name. And we can tell from her condition, which was an issue of blood, back then in Bible times, it was treated a lot like leprosy. It was a condition that was considered unclean. And because of that, she would have been treated as one that was unclean, which meant she couldn't touch anybody. Uh, she likely even had to live alone because she couldn't be around other people in case that she contaminated something that they would touch. Her life for 12 years had been a nightmare. I can't even imagine the misery this woman has been through. It, it, the Bible clearly says she had suffered many things at the hands of many physicians. She was desperate. She was desperate to be healed. She had sought help. She had sought physicians. She had sought remedies. She had spent every bit of money she had. And the Bible says she wasn't any better for it. Instead, she was worse. So I think here, I want to start with this woman. Even though she's not the important one in the story, I want to start with her because I can relate more with her. Because I don't have a big name and I don't have a lot of fame and I am not a big important person and you're probably the same way. So... I want to talk about this woman first, and then we'll get back to Jairus and his daughter. So here's this woman. She has tried everything. She has spent all that she had. I think, honestly, at this point, she felt she had nothing left to lose. And by being out in this crowd, because the Bible says that there were so many people, they were thronging Jesus. I mean, there was just people that were pushing. It was a crowd. She was not supposed to be there. She was not supposed to be around other people. And if she were to come across other people like the lepers, she was supposed to call out and you know, say, I'm unclean, stay away. But instead, she risked it all, her life included. Because had she been found out, she could have been stoned. She could have been killed. She really was risking her life. But she had enough faith. In Jesus, a man by all accounts, we don't know that she's ever met. But from what she had heard about Jesus, she had enough faith in him and his power that she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I don't even have to touch him, just his clothes. If I could just touch the hem of his garment, I believe I could be healed. So she does. She reaches out in the midst of this crowd of people and somehow gets a hold of the hem of his robe. And at that moment, it's as that Jesus knew. I mean, it's kind of obvious because Jesus is God and he is all-knowing, so he knows everything anyway. But it was kind of him making it known to his disciples and to the people around him that he does know all and he does see all. And so he stops and he says, who touched me? And the disciples kind of had this attitude of, well, duh, who didn't touch you? There's all these people. Everybody's pushing and shoving. People are probably, several people were trying to get to Jesus and to touch him to be healed. But Jesus knew it wasn't an accidental touch. It was somebody who 
reached out in faith. And we know that Jesus knew exactly who it was. Because if you read the verse, it says that when he looked around to see her, to see the woman who had touched him. She who had touched him. He knew who it was. I think what he wanted to see was if she would slip away with her stolen miracle because she didn't ask for that miracle. She took it. But Jesus was okay with that. But was she going to slip away or was she going to stand up and admit what she had done and if you kind of think about it from a human standpoint it seems a little bit cruel because this woman was obviously trying to not be noticed that's why she was down on the ground touching the hem of his garment that's why she was sneaking in so it almost seems kind of cruel that Jesus would point her out when he knows that she's trying to slip in and slip out without being noticed but here's the thing we have to see, okay? Because we, if we miss this, then it does seem, well, that was kind of cruel. Why didn't he just let her slip away? Because he knew she was healed. And she knew she was healed. But what about the rest of the people? In their eyes, she was still unclean. But by pointing her out and having her step forward and claim what she did, Jesus was able to say, you're clean in front of all of those people. And if Jesus said it, those people didn't doubt it. They believed from that moment forward that that woman was clean. She didn't have to go through all these rituals. She didn't have to go show herself to the priest. She didn't have to go through all that hassle. When he called forward to her and said, who touched me? And she came forward and said, I did. I touched you. Jesus was able to say, you're clean and you're whole. Your faith has made you whole. And like I said, by doing that, it proclaimed to the whole, everybody there, which I'm sure passed it along to people, that she was clean. And from that moment, she could get her life. She could start living again. But my favorite part of her encounter with Jesus is the name that Jesus gives to her. Remember, she didn't have a name that was mentioned, but Jesus gives her a name. He gives her a title, and it's the only time Jesus called another woman by this title in the entire Bible. He called her daughter. Daughter. This was a woman, remember, who may or may not have had family. But for the past 12 years, we can pretty much be sure that she has felt alone and discouraged and frightened. And by calling her daughter, Jesus was reminding her that she was never alone and she will never be alone. Her heavenly father loves and cares for her. But I think also Jesus called her daughter because remember there's she's not the only character in the story. There is someone else in this story that is standing by waiting for Jesus to come heal his daughter. Jairus had already talked to Jesus. Jesus was on his way to Jairus' house to heal his daughter as Jairus had asked. And this woman basically interrupted. I'm sure Jairus had a heart for the woman. I'm sure he had compassion for her. But as a parent, I'm sure he was ready for Jesus to get moving and head to his house so he could heal Jairus' daughter. I'm sure he was beyond impatient at this point. And I don't blame him. He was a, a father. But what Jesus did when he called this woman daughter is he reminded Jairus, I know you love your daughter and you want what's best for her. But I love my daughter too and I want what's best for her. 
And I think that might have softened things a little bit in Jairus' heart. But then, just when things were looking a little better, a servant comes from Jairus' household and says, Your daughter's dead. You don't even need to bother with Jesus anymore. There's nothing he can do now. There's nothing he can do now. It's too late. She's gone. Just leave the master. And that's another point that I want to bring to our attention. And in this way, I'm a lot more like Jairus, I think, than the woman. The woman had faith that if she could just touch the hem of his garment, she would be healed. Jairus had faith that Jesus could heal, but not that he could raise her from the dead. He had faith in what he saw and what he thought possible because if you look back to what he asked Jesus he said come and touch her so that you can heal her well Jesus didn't have to touch her Jesus could have spoken from that spot and said let her be healed and she could have been healed he did that in another story where all he did was speak and say he's whole and it was so so he didn't have to touch her, but in Jairus's mind, it was, this is how it works. These are the stories I've heard. I've heard that Jesus touched somebody and they were healed. And Jesus touched this person and they were healed. And Jesus touched that person. He had it in his mind that this is the way it works. Jesus touches and you're healed. And sometimes we get it in our mind that Jesus always does things the same way. We hear where God met a need for somebody in a certain way and we say well I have that same need so God should do the same thing for me well that may not be God's will he doesn't always do things the same way he doesn't always work in people's lives in the same way that he worked in somebody else's life or in each situation Uh, take the many different lepers that there are in the Bible so many times we see Jesus encountering the lepers and sometimes he touched them Sometimes he did other things. Sometimes he spoke to. It just, it was just up to him how he wanted to do it. But Jairus had it in his mind. This is the way it happens. And when that didn't happen, Jairus says, oh, well, now it's just not going to happen at all. It's no use. And if we're not careful, we can get that way. When God doesn't move a certain way at a certain time, we can throw up our hands and say, oh, well, God coming through I'll just have to take thing, take matters into my own hands and... but that's not the way we should be we should have faith that God's ways are above our ways it's, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts and when sometimes they just don't make sense to us whatsoever the Bible assures us that he knows what's best and that all things work together for good to those who love God. But we have to have faith that he can do that. So when Jesus hears this servant telling Jairus, it's too late, he says, well, just hang on. It's not too late. It's going to be fine. Just believe. Just believe. And I guess Jairus did believe a little bit because he continued on with Jesus and they went to the house and of course there was all this weeping and wailing and crying and carrying on and in that day they had some strange mourning customs. Of course, you know, the family and friends were genuinely mourning and crying because they had lost a loved one. But they also would hire mourners to come in and, and grieve with the family. So you had all this chaos going on. And Jesus comes in and he says, Why are they weeping and crying? She's not dead. She's just sleeping. The Bible says they laughed him to school. Why is it so hard for us to believe in miracles? We've seen them. I've seen them. I've seen them in my own life. I have seen how God has come through in some of the most unusual and miraculous way. But then when I face another trying situation, I find myself 
laughing him to scorn and saying, no, but this problem is too big. Nothing is too big for me. Nothing is too hard for God. And he proves it. He proves it right then and there to this group, this family. He cast out all the mourners, all of everybody go away. I want my disciples here, Peter, James, and John. And I want the mother and the father and everybody else go away. Because you know what? They didn't believe anyway. So we don't need that. And that's just another thing that just kind of came to my mind is sometimes we need to get away from certain because there are people that don't believe and there are people that are very negative I call them naysayers and they will try to keep us from doing what we know we should do they will try to keep us from acting in faith they will try to steer us away from God and from his word and so we have to be very careful who we fellowship with who we allow in our circle of influence because negative influences for some reason seem to be stronger than positive influences and it's easier to get dragged down than it is to get boosted up. so be very careful we need to be very careful about who we hang around with and who we allow to influence us but back to the story like I said, that just kind of came to my mind and I feel like that needed to be said. Jesus throws them all out. He goes, he holds the girl by the hand and notice what he calls her. Not daughter. Damsel. Which is still a sweet term. It's very precious. But like I said, daughter was reserved for that one woman. And I think that's wonderful. I think that's spectacular. But he calls her damsel and he holds her hand and he tells her to to get up and sure enough she's up she was dead and now she's alive and she's sitting there and I would imagine kind of rubbing her eyes thinking that was a good nap <laughs> whether she even knew she was dead I can't say it, it's hard to know what happened in that time <laughs> but what I do know is she was dead the Bible makes that clear. And then she was alive. And then here's the part that just kind of blows your mind, but you got to think of It's one of those things you got to think through a little bit. Jesus tells them, mother, father, Peter, James, John, and this daughter. He tells them, don't tell anybody what just happened. Don't tell anybody? <laughs> really? You just saw something like that? Wouldn't you want to shout it from... I mean, especially those parents. Wouldn't you want to shout it from the rooftops? But he said, don't tell anybody. And there are several occasions through the scripture. I'm actually doing a study on it now just because this intrigued me. And I'm doing a study on it now where I'm going through the scriptures. And I'm looking at the times that Jesus did miracles and the times that he said, don't tell anyone. He'll do a miracle and he'll say, tell no man that I did this. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. And in my mind, I think, that makes no sense. You're Jesus. You're God. You're mighty. You're wonderful. You're doing these wonderful things. Wouldn't you want everybody to know so that everybody would trust you? But would everybody trust him? Or would they just come to him for healing? And I think that's one of the main reasons that Jesus said this. We see it in the account of the, the ten lepers that came to Jesus and they were healed. And only one of them came back to say thank you. The rest of them once they got their healing, they were gone. They went back to their ways, back to their lives. Sometimes, if we're careful, we can seek the healing more than the healer. You know? We want what Jesus can do for us more than we want Jesus himself. 
And if you read through these passages in the scripture, particularly in the Gospels where we see Jesus' ministry, we see there's constantly people bringing their sick to Jesus for healing. They're constantly, constantly, constantly coming. And in that way, Jesus had compassion and he healed them, but it was hindering from his real mission and his real ministry, which wasn't just to heal people. His ministry was to teach people and to introduce people to this new way that the sacrifices of old would soon be done away with. They wouldn't be necessary anymore. That he had come to be the sacrifice. He had a mission and a ministry to tell others about him, not just to come and heal them. And in his fame becoming so spread abroad, there were times he couldn't even get into the city because there were so many people. And it says he had to go to a desert place where there were no people. And even then they followed. But the the thing is, is most of them were coming for teaching. They weren't coming to learn more about him. They were coming to see miracles and to be healed. And so Jesus said, told tell anyone. Now, in this particular passage in Mark, that's where it ends. But in one of the other passages, I believe it's in Matthew, where it tells the same account. It says that right after the story and his fame went abroad in the city, <laughs> which tells me somebody did not listen. Jesus said, don't tell anybody. But somebody told maybe several somebody and his fame went abroad and that was where it said he couldn't even get into the city because there were so many people saying heal me heal me and it was hindering the work that he was really here to do and sometimes we have to remember that again like I said earlier the way things were in one situation is not the way things were necessarily in the, in another situation for example, in that situation, Jesus said, don't tell. In our situation, we have been commanded to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. We have been commanded to tell others all around the world what Jesus has done for us. How he healed us, maybe not physically, Although I think all of us have felt his healing touch at some point in our lives. But how he healed us spiritually. And that now we are no longer under the bondage of sin because of his great sacrifice. And friends, we are commanded to tell. It's not a secret anymore. It doesn't need to be kept quiet. We need to tell and so as we conclude this tale of two miracles, I hope you've enjoyed this. This is, I said, this is one, I know I say that all the time, that this is one of my favorites, but it is. It's one of my uh, favorite stories, accounts in the Bible. And it reminds me, I think, too, that God is never too busy to help us with our problems. Yes, Jesus was on his way to help somebody else. And this woman came along. But he had time to stop and help her. And to proclaim her daughter and clean. He took the time. He had the time. And it's a great reminder and comfort to me to know that while God, yes, is running the universe, he's never too busy for me any situation I have, whether it's big or small. You know, sometimes we think, well, this is just a little thing and, and, and you know, God has bigger things to worry about. God wants to help us with anything and everything if we'll just give him the chance. He's never too busy. He always has time for us. And 
we are his children and he loves us just as Jairus loved his daughter and he wants what's best for us.